Um, look, I was going to say before I move on, um, I'm, you know, you guys have just been through Cyclone Gabriel, you guys have been through stuff for a long time here, you know a lot more about a lot of these issues than I do, so I'm really just going to share some of my views as a, as a forest ecologist, as someone who's worked in rural landscapes for a long time. But I am from um, the South Island and that, that is where the bulk of my experience is. But um, I, hope, I hope the discussion afterwards will be, will be a really useful um, outcome from this evening. So a little bit about who am I. Um, I've spent nearly 40 years working at the University of Canterbury. I was in the School of Forestry at the University of Canterbury. I started working there when we had a New Zealand Forest Service. Um, and my role was to, because the New Zealand Forest Service managed the bulk of the native forests in Aotearoa, um, my role was to train the students and give the students a good grounding in forest ecology, native forest ecology. So I spent the first 10, 20 years of my career working in forests like the one on the left there, um, our lowland podocarp rainforest of the west coast, Taipotini. Um, amazing forest, but, but floristically quite simple. I come out here with Sam this week and going around the forest here and they're just so incredibly diverse compared to what I'm used to. Um, but that's where I started off. As I moved on in my career, I got really interested in threatened plants and, and spent a good decade or more working on a variety of threatened plants. Um, spent a lot of time working with mistletoes, and of course you've got mistletoes up here as well. Um, both the stunning uh, beech mistletoes, but some of the other ones as well. And a range of other threatened plants. That bottom picture is one of our South Island, Eastern South Island hebes, um, and work there. As I progressed on in my career, I became really interested in, in um, the ecology of remnants, of fragments of forest, and particularly how we can restore and use restoration as a tool to put forest back into the landscape. And I got involved both in a, in a practical sense with helping um, plan projects and run projects, and then also um, had obviously multiple students uh, work on restoration projects. And that pair of photographs on the left there uh, is a restoration project associated with the uh, Canterbury Regional Landfill in North Canterbury uh, over um, you know, 18 years apart, 16 years apart. And you can see the infilling both more in the foreground and also around the forest edge in the background and quite a lot of infilling through both through planting and through um, just natural regeneration. And we're in, well I've, I've now you know, moved on from that project, but um, we're now starting a program of trying to get Kaikatea forest through that valley floor there, putting this drip wetness back into the valley and, and then bring the Kaikatea forest back. And the right hand photograph is actually one of the plants just down in the foreground in the bottom image there. That's a potra that's probably about 12 years old now. Um, the, um, the, the ribbon wood and some of the other trees are a bit taller at the moment, but that tortura is definitely going for it, and that's pretty exciting. And then the other um, work I've been really involved in, and probably what I've done most in the last um, decade, uh, a little bit longer, is working with farmers and um, helping farmers understand what biodiversity they have on their farms, how their farm management's interacting with that biodiversity, and how they can incorporate biodiversity into farm management to get win-win outcomes for farmers and, and, and for biodiversity. So these are both photographs on the same farm on Banks Peninsula, one of the places I work. Um, obviously a, a forest that's been impacted by livestock. Uh, it's a matai stand, a uh, beautiful, beautiful matai stand. And then the same farm are doing some restoration work here and, and just getting people to understand what's going on and, and, and how you can incorporate it, helping them write biodiversity management plans. I've also spent a lot of time, particularly in the last decade again, but probably for more than that, working in the South Island high country. Um, it's quite a unique environment. The farms are large, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 hectares. Uh, this is part of Mount Nicholas Station on the far side of um, Lake Whakatipu. Uh, but working with them, understanding again how their grazing systems are interacting with biodiversity and helping restore monitoring and, and helping write management plans. So it's a little bit about who I am and, and you know, what, what I bring to this discussion here. As I said, my, my experience is primarily um, in, in the South Island, um, but I have been fortunate to spend time, particularly in this area here actually, since um, at least 2017. I've done several trips up here and, and um, you know, I've enjoyed my visits as part of the country. So I wanted to sort of start off the, the uh, more formal part of what I want to talk about by really making the point that we can't look at either climate change or biodiversity in isolation. The two are so closely interlinked. Um, and if we are to conserve our unique and, and, and special and precious biodiversity, we have to address the climate crisis. And our biodiversity is going to be really important to help us address the climate crisis. So we've got to look at both of them together. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples from, from things I've been involved in or experienced in. 
That's a piece of southern beech forest. It's mainly mountain beech with a little bit of red and, red and silver beech. And it looks pretty good when you look at it from a distance. But when you zoom in, you start to see an awful lot of dead canopies. And they're dead canopies because this is down in the Southern Lakes area again. We've been getting much stronger droughts in summer than we've ever had before. And we're getting sequences of droughts in summer. And those droughts are killing trees. And that is a consequence of climate change. And we're seeing that you know, throughout um, our forests in, in different parts of the country. Another example here is this one. This, this is the only, um, you, the only true alpine bird in Aotearoa, the rock wren. Um, and um, this photograph was on the Marks Range behind Haas, was up there at Easter. Um, and there were three or four populations of rock wrens. Rock wrens have done pretty well so far. They're, they're up high, they do have predators up there. But with climate change, all of the evidence is starting to show us that predators are moving higher. And so a bird like this is going to be threatened by climate change, not necessarily because of changes in the weather, but because of the movement of predators further up slope. So if we want to conserve our biodiversity, we have to address the climate change crisis. But equally, as I hope you'll take from my presentation tonight, if we are to address um, the climate change, sorry, if we are to address the climate change crisis, then we need to use our biodiversity to do it. So this is a restoration planting in the foreground and natural regeneration in the background with one solitary remnant tortura there in the middle on the Port Hills, Canterbury. Um, and it's forests like these that are going to play a critical role in drawing down atmospheric carbon dioxide and helping to allow us to um, maybe ease back from that 1.5 degree warming threshold. So I think when we talk about um, climate change and we talk about biodiversity, we cannot talk about them in isolation from each other. They're both really important. Look, the next point I want to make is that when we look at Aotearoa, we need to recognise that we live in a land that is dominated by monocultures. And there's a lot of talk about monocultures. And I want to make the point really that monocultures are, are not just about plantation forestry, they're about lots of things we do in our landscape. So clearly we're all familiar with plantation forests. They are monocultures, they are extensive, um, they cover large areas, um, and they are harvested in large clear cuts by and large. They are very simple landscape elements um, and you're all very familiar with them. Whoops, we one too many. Pushing the buttons a bit hard here. But our farming systems are also predominantly monocultures, not necessarily one species, they could be white grass clover or other species as well, but they're also very simple systems. And large areas of our farming landscapes are also covered in what are effectively monocultures. And it's important that we recognise that. And then you already saw that. But then some of our other systems are as well. Um, our arable systems, um, wheat on the Canary Plains, there's lots of maize up here, but also things like viticulture and um, all sorts of you know, avocado orchards and, and so on and so on. They're also all monocultures. Um, and it's important to recognise, I think, that it's not just plantation forestry that is a monoculture, it's also all these other land uses as, as well. We have very simple landscapes in Aotearoa, much of Aotearoa. And as you all know, and thanks to Sam for the photograph, monocultures are not resilient. Monocultures are uh, subject to severe impacts from um, events like Cyclone Gabriel. And um, when you look at the aerial photography and the Uala catchment there, you're probably all familiar with this, you know, we can see the lack of resilience coming out of monocultural landscapes. So I think it's really important when we start thinking about where we want to go in the future, how we want to tackle the climate change crisis and the biodiversity crisis, that we think about monocultures and we think about how we can move away from monocultural landscapes. And that's probably my major theme tonight. We want diverse, multifunctional landscapes. And I'm not saying that particular landscape is, is perfect by any means, but it has got a wider range of elements in it. It's got some horticulture, it's got some plantation forests, it's got quite a few bush remnants, it's got pastoral farming, that's thanks to Insula. Um, but it's a more diverse landscape. We need to be encouraging more diverse landscapes across all of Aotearoa. Okay, so now I want to talk about plantations of exotic trees, because I know it's a, an issue of much concern here um, in, in, in Tairawhiti, but it's also a real concern in several other parts of Aotearoa as well. And I think when I look at, look, I've worked in a forestry school all of my, my university career. I should have said that um, I retired from the university about a year and a half ago, I meant to say that before. And I now actually live at Lake Hawea in the Southern Lakes, 
Um, and and um, you know, I'm now working uh, with farmers primarily. I sort of skipped over that little bit of mention there. Um, when I look at plantations of exotic trees, we're talking mainly about radiator pine, a little bit of Douglas fir, a little bit of other things as well. I look at it and I can see the good, the bad and the ugly to take a, um, a line from a, a movie from many years ago. Plantation, well-managed plantation forests in the right parts of the landscapes, managed in ways that are, that are appropriate for those landscapes, are critical for Aotearoa. We need these plantations. They are really, really important. Um, plantations, well-managed plantation supplies with, with timber for building. We should be using a lot more in building. They supply us with potentially with biofuel. Uh, they supply us with potentially uh, various types of chemicals that we can use. They are really, really important for Aotearoa. So well-managed plantations are critical. They are an important part of the landscape. And I think it's really important we don't regard plantations all as bad because I think you know, plantations have got a critical role to play in this country. Unfortunately, and again, as we're very, very uh, aware up in this part of the country, things don't always work out right. And bad plantation management, plantations that are managed in ways that aren't appropriate for the landscapes they're located in, are causing us problems. And this is up in Tairakati. This is taken, these next three photographs are taken in 2017. Um, and we all know the consequences. And this is Tolaga Bay in 2017. And we've just seen it again and again. Um, so, you know, good well-managed plantations in the right landscapes, managed in the right ways, and I've argued for a long time that we should be having much smaller clear cuts and, and greater diversity in them, but that's a slightly different story. But well-managed plantations are fine, but plantations that are managed poorly are going to have adverse impacts on the environment, and that's bad. We don't want that. Um, and, um, you know, I, sh I should acknowledge um, this is 2017, and I, I realise that um, there have been changes in plantation management here, and some of the students I've taught, I'm not sure if they're in the audience or not tonight, you know, will be involved in some of those changes, but we are still seeing the consequences of bad management. And I think, you know, to give you my thoughts for the future, I think we really need to look seriously at how we deal with some of these landscapes, and that's again inland from Tolaga Bay, I can't remember exactly where it is, some of you might recognise it. And, and I've said this publicly before, and I had it in an article in Newsroom earlier on in the year, to me, I think in Tairawhiti, I believe we need a catchment by catchment assessment to determine where plantation harvesting should occur and where it shouldn't occur. And I think we need to do the same thing with planting of new plantation forests, where it is and where it isn't appropriate. In terms of the nature of the landscapes, the erosion potential, all of the other consequences that come from it. And I think we need a program of active conversion to native forests for those plantations that we can't have, that we that are unsuitable to harvest. And that's something that I think government is responsible for. Government planted those forests in the first place, and I believe government has a responsibility there. That's my personal view on, on that issue. And then, in my mind, there is the ugly. And to me, the ugly, you probably won't be surprised when I'm saying this, the ugly is carbon monocultures. I think they are morally corrupt. Um, I think carbon farming, Plant and leave carbon farming is morally corrupt for three reasons. It does absolutely nothing for emissions reductions. And that's the fault of the ETS. The people doing it are just taking advantage of a system that is actually completely at, at, at fault. And it's good that the ETS has been reviewed and hopefully that, that changes. But I think they're, they're not permanent. You know, the ETS only talks about 50 years. 50 years isn't permanent. We're burning coal and oil that's been sitting in the ground for tens or hundreds of millions of years. You know, a forest of radiated pine sitting in, in the ground for 50 years is not permanent. And I believe it's going to leave significant, substantial environmental, social and economic legacies for future generations. For the people who own the land, for the people who live in the catchments and fund the management of those landscapes, I think there's going to be massive liability in the future. For that reason, I believe it's morally corrupt. It may well be legal, but it's not right. And in terms of transitioning, I mean, everyone talks about transitioning these plantations into native forest. It's, it's magic. It's going to happen. I believe it's ecologically fraudulent. I've worked on this. It was my student, Adam Forbes. Some of you may have heard Adam talk about this stuff. Adam did his PhD with me. And I've visited lots of these stands. This is an 80-year-old stand of radiata. It is not transitioning. Um, there, yes, there's a nice understory of tree ferns, but there's not a single podocarp in it. There's no tarwa, there's no uh, through the 40s. So the Forest Service set up a trial, I think it was set up in the 50s, and they planted Remo and other conifers into it. They actively planted them into it. And they've grown pretty well. You can see them there in the understory. The ponderosa is basically just about gone now. But there's nothing else in there. 
even though they were planted, there's nothing else coming away in there. Um, and that's probably the best example in New Zealand. Transitions will only occur if there are suitable climates and there are seed sources in close proximity and the stands are actively managed. They're actively managed for plant and animal pest control. We all know the impacts of um, goats and deer. Um, we need active canopy manipulation. Dothostroma was taking out that canopy there, um, but Dothostroma is not affecting canopies now. And we're going to need enrichment planting, actually going into these stands and actively planting the later forest species to take over. And this management is going to need to occur for decades or even centuries, not something that just takes place for a decade or two. It's going to have to take place for 50, 60, 100 years. And that's well after the period of carbon credits has run out. Um, so who's going to pay for it? So I've been pretty shocked on this trip up here. I, you know, I've been here several times before, but um, this is on the way down to uh, Mahia a couple of days ago, and this is only one of several examples. And I, I really worry about you know, what's happening there and, and that whole process. And you know, really my concern comes down to what I just said before. You know, if these forests are going to be transitioned, someone's got to pay for it. Someone's got to put the money there up front. And what I'm suggesting, and, and what I'm um, about to put another article in the newsroom shortly, I think the people who are doing carbon farming should be required to... Is it my next slide? I can't remember now. Um, no, let's go back. I think the people doing carbon farming should be required to put a significant amount of their carbon credits into some sort of uh, non-waste endowment fund. Um, that's held quite independently from them, and that's then used to fund the transition, if we allow transitions. But transitions should only occur in the right parts of the landscape where rainfall and seed sources can actually mean that and might actually possibly occur, with that funding being set aside to guarantee that it actually occurs. Because after those credits are dried up in 30 years, um, I don't think the people that have earned the credits are necessarily going to hang around to look after those plantations in 100 years. So what I'm suggesting is what we need are diverse, multifunctional landscapes in which we have plantation forestry in the right places, we have pastoral farming, we have horticulture, we have communities living, and we have native forests. And I think that will provide us with the resilience against climate change, and I think it will be critical for enhancing our native biodiversity. And as I said, that catchment there on Banks Peninsula is far from perfect, but I think it's a lot better than a number of catchments I see around the place. And I believe, and of course I'm very biased towards native trees, I believe native forest has to be a really critical part of these diverse landscapes. Native forests can offer us so much um, across so many different parts of our, our life and our, our landscapes. That's a, a beef farm up in Northland, actually managed beef farm in Northland, and the bottom photograph is over Taranui, it's a sheep and beef farm there with a really nice restoration plan in the foreground. Um, you know, we've got these stands out, these places, examples out there, we just need to scale it up and do it much more widely. So what I want to do now, and I think I'm about halfway, um, I'm not going too fast. Um, what I want to do now is talk about this program called Recloaking Papatua Anuku. So this is something that Pure Advantage and, and a range of other partners are working on. It hasn't gone live yet, we're just still, still developing the concept and I've been sort of working as, a, uh, as an ecological advisor on the program. Uh, it's coming out of the Otato Nahiri series. I'm not sure if any of you were at the uh, conference in Wellington last year, which was awesome. Um, it was the biggest forestry conference ever in New Zealand and it's just about native forests. And as I should say, um, Laura Watson and Sam Gibson came on a panel with me and they were great and it was awesome to have that representation from this part of the country to talk about you know, how we can make native forests a really important part of our landscapes. Um, so what we're working on now is looking at trying to put forward this, this, this program which we are calling Recloaking Papatua Nuku. And Dame Anne Salmon, who obviously many of you know, is very intimately involved in, in the development of this program. So what it involves, um, essentially, and we're still, we're still developing the ideas, it's basically a program that's aimed to mobilise urgent action, it's ambitious, um, and it's designed to address a range of things. If we're not ambitious, um, we will not tackle these, these crises we're facing. It's designed to build landscape resilience, to give us landscapes that can actually handle these intense storm events we're getting more and more of. It's designed to give us a landscape that can sequester atmospheric carbon dioxide in a permanent way, not in a way that just, just makes money for the people doing it, it actually is permanent. It's designed to enhance our native biodiversity. And it's, allowed, it's designed to allow all to reconnect with the natural world 
has been part of the natural world. So what we're suggesting, and this is the ambition, we're suggesting 2 million hectares of new native forest, and we're suggesting 3, uh, 3 million hectares of existing regenerating and degraded native forest being actively managed. The new native forest will, will, will help build that landscape resilience by putting it into parts of the landscape where there isn't native forest at the moment. Uh, and it will obviously um, draw down carbon dioxide as well, and it will obviously provide amazing habitat for biodiversity. And I mean, imagine if we had, we, we've been lucky this week, we've been here in two in every forest remnant um, that we've, we've walked through up north of here, but, uh, but in Canterbury, um, you know, you, you hardly ever get to. Imagine we had native forests through all of our areas, bringing these birds back and being part of our landscape. The three million hectares of existing regenerated and degraded forest is really about carbon drawdown. It's about um, biodiversity um, conservation. And we're suggesting that this happens within, at least, at least it's implemented and starts happening within 10 years. And it's across private, iwi and public land. There's a lot of land out there that we could do this in. Five million hectares is an awful lot of Aotearoa. But I do believe that if we're not ambitious and we don't aim high, we might as well walk away. You know, we really need to be ambitious. We need to go to get something underway that's really going to make a difference. Because we are facing a bloody crisis out there, a massive crisis out there. And I, think, I certainly think the government is sleepwalking over it, and I think a lot of the population is as well. So what does it involve? So we're suggesting, um, if we can, half a million hectares of new plantings. Um, there's two examples there, both, both from Canterbury. The top one's a nice, diverse um, podocarp uh, broadleaf. So Tortura sticking its head up there. It's about 30, 40 years old now. The bottom one's a Karnaka planting. Both of those are on the Port Hills. Um, we're suggesting about half a million hectares of new planting. A lot of that will be on private farmland, but there's also uh, iwi land, and of course there's quite a bit of public land um, owned by councils and, and the like that is suitable for this. I think it's the role of these planting should be around trying, primarily trying to build landscape resilience, trying to, um, you know, our riparian plantings, uh, trying to look at um, critical source areas where nutrients and sediment leach from, trying to improve the health of our landscapes. Uh, improving connectivity between remnants, buffering remnants, um, all of those sorts of functions uh, across our landscapes. But I also think there's a lot of room for um, natural reversion. Um, this is on Banks Peninsula again. Um, a lot of people have tried to farm that land, it really isn't worth it. Um, and I think we're much better to actually put it, subject it to active management for biodiversity and carbon by controlling, uh, grazing, excluding grazing animals, uh, controlling feral animals, and then doing enrichment planting to try and speed up the process of that natural regeneration. And we're, we're suggesting, and, and there's been quite a bit of analysis done by both Land Care Research and by um, uh, my colleagues at AUT, Brad Case and Hannah Buckley, looking at how much of this is across Aotearoa, and there are quite large areas that are suitable for this. It's marginal farmland, but it could really build resilience in, in those headwaters areas where, where a lot of um, the erosion and sedimentation starts from. And then the three million hectares um, of, of existing forest, there are massive areas, and you guys know this around here, there are huge areas of Karnaka, uh, Manaka, uh, and other types of cereal forest. A lot of it, sadly, is, is going backwards. This is actually in the Wairau land from Wairau a few years ago now. And that Karnaka stand will go backwards and will, will end up collapsing and go back into rough pasture again. We need to take those areas, we need to look after them, same, same, same recipe, we need to exclude uh, domestic grazing animals, we need to control the ungulates, the goats and the deer, um, we need to control possums, uh, we need to enrich, and it's incredible what will come away in those areas. And it always amazes me, look, Sam and I were wandering around a bit of bush the other day and we found this meadow seedling, it was only about this high, a tiny meadow seedling. And we haven't seen a meadow in any of the remnants we've been in around that whole area. So obviously a bird's brought that in from maybe 20 kilometres away. You know, nature will do it, we just need to give it a little helping hand. And the best helping hand we can do is get rid of grazers, control possums, um, possibly think about um, rodents as well, and then do enrichment planting. And these stands can be transitioned to a much more diverse native forest state. And then we also have surprisingly large areas of cutover um, mainly podocarp broadleaf forest. You see a lot of this through the King Country. Um, I'm sure that I haven't seen so much up here. I'm sure there are examples around here as well. Um, this is near Tawanui. Um, it's had, it's, it's got a solid canopy. Well, actually, we've been walking through this week, I guess, Sam, isn't it? Yeah. 
<laughs> it's got a solid canopy of, of reo reo and tawa. Um, there will be um, a range of other angiosperm trees. There's a bit of totara around the edge here in this case. Um, but there are massive big stumps of totara through this. And there would have been rimu and miro and matai and all those other trees in there as well. We can speed up these forests. They've lost their big element. You know, the big carbon stores in those forests were the podocarps. They've gone. We can bring them back. We need to control. This is full of goats. It was incredible. It was full of goats. It's actually in the Whenua Rahui Covenant, but it was full of goats. So the domestic livestock were excluded. But we can, we can allow that forest to move on just by managing it. But it's TLC. It's not actually very hard to do. And we know how to do this work. You know, we've been doing it for years in Aotearoa. We're actually really good at it. We know, you know, that's a, a grazing exclusion fence line there. We know what happens when we exclude grazing animals. We know the impact of deer on the bottom left here. We know what happens when we can get those animals out of the system. You know, we still need to do a bit more work in upscaling our nurseries, and, and there's good work going on, and, and every time I hear, hear a new example of a nursery trying a new methodology, it, it's getting better and better. And we know how to get plants to establish. We know how to do the mahi. It's, it's, it's well done. It's just that place that's the problem, um, or part of the problem. You know, we need to get the policy settings right. Um, we need to have the policy settings right, and we need to make, have the financial tools to make it possible. Um, we need to reset the ETS. We need to make native forest as the only permanent forest in the ETS. Um, and we need to provide some sort of biodiversity payment to recognise that actually native forests provide a hell of a lot more to us than just carbon sequestration. They provide so much more to us. Um, and we need to have some sort of biodiversity payment system. So how do we fund it? How do we make it work? And what I believe is we need a mix. I mean, I believe government should be funding some of it because it's in all of our interest and it's in our children and our grandchildren's interest. And that's a government thing. But I think those who benefit from our clean green image, quote unquote, um, should also be paying for it because they're marketing our products and they're marketing our image based on it being clean and green. And I think, you know, if we share the funding load, we can make it work. And so I'd suggest that tourism and those who sell our farm products should also be paying for this. It should be an integral part of, of our, our dairy and our meat and our other primary production um, um, companies who are selling our products offshore, and it should definitely be part of our tourism um, to help pay for this, because they're coming here to enjoy it. Um, Queensland Airport is a... Since COVID, it's just, it's just as busy as it's ever been. It's quite staggering. And I think it should be part of the social licence of the plantation forestry sector. I think, um, you know, um, the plantation forestry sector should actually be paying for native reforestation. Um, it's part of their social licence. And it was, it was good to hear, the, I was at the School of Forestry's 50th anniversary conference a couple of weeks ago, and Grant Dob Dobson, the, um, the, 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 the chair of um, um, Forest Owners Association, saying they've got to address their social licence. They do, and this is a great way to do it. They can pay for native reforestation as part of their social licence. I don't think they're short of money, lots to be made. And I think there should be a levy on carbon credits for all exotic tree monocultures. I think there should be a levy coming out of um, those carbon credits that goes to native reforestation as well. But I think there are a whole range of other models as well. And I mean, they're the obvious things and the easy ones. There are actually some really innovative things happening up, out there in Aotearoa and internationally. And look, I'm, I can't speak about all of them. This is one I've been involved in. Sheep Inc. are a um, European knitwear company. They do you know, high-end garments um, made out of merino wool sourced from New Zealand. Um, they're based in Britain. They're only online. They only sell online, so you can go and buy their stuff online. And they look pretty stunning garments. They produce. These two guys are actually the founders of it. Um, and one of their sheep there, which is not a merino, but that's by the by. Um, their, their gardens are all made by merino. They're funding this restoration project here on, on the shores of Lake Tawia. They're putting their money into paying for that restoration project. And, you know, um, you know it's, that's an offshore company, you know, doing that. And I think there are many other examples both here. I mean, I know stuff happening here uh, in Gisborne with, with, with groups and all around Aotearoa. So I think there's lots of other ways as well. Um, but I do believe the primary share should be through government and, and those who make money out of our clean green image. Whoops, one too many there, sorry. And I think, and this is where I really want to finish, um, and I, I can't, 
And I'm going to be under time, so that's a lot of time for questions. I can't um, underemphasize the importance of this. I really believe that this program would only work if it's driven from the bottom up. Um, I, I, it scares the hell out of me. If government gets really, really excited and says, oh, we'll get MPI and DOC and MFE to run, it's going to grind to a halt. It's got to be driven from the bottom up. And I'm, I'm a great advocate for catchment groups. I think catchment groups have got an amazing role to play in this because, I mean, they're the people who are on the ground. They're out there already doing so many amazing things, um, and I think they've got a really important role. But I also believe our young people, our Rangatahi, have got an amazing role to play in this. I, I have a vision. I'd love to see every kid in New Zealand spend a week every year during their school years out in nature, reconnecting with nature. And, and I know, um, you know, I'm always inspired by what Sam does, you know, with his, his groups. Um, you know, just when you see their excitement and their enthusiasm and their interest and, and, and they're going to be the, the decision makers and the business leaders and the everything else in the future. And I think they have to be an integral part of it. Um, I really believe that. And so I just think we, I, I'm scared at the moment with Jobs and Nature finishing, our catchment groups are going to really face a funding crisis. We have to do something about that. I would like to think recloaking Papatua and Luku might be part of the solution for that. So 35 minutes. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope that was interesting and worth um, you know giving up your evening for. And look, I'm really happy to have a discussion. And I don't have all the answers, but um, you know, hopefully that was that was of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Very interesting. Uh, just a question. We hear about New Zealand building a very large bills internationally as, uh, for our, um, our emissions over our sequestration. Couldn't somehow that large bill be reduced? Yeah, that's a really yeah, really good question. So this is our nationally determined contribution, which runs between, I think, um, 15, million and 30, uh, 15 billion and 30 billion or something by 2030 and more after that. Absolutely, it's one of the things, I should have actually mentioned it, it's one of the things that we've talked about as a possible source of funding for this. I mean, it, what, what it means though is that the government has to default on meeting its short-term targets. But I would argue that surely having a long-term goal is far more important than a short-term goal that's propped up by carbon forestry. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really good suggestion. And again, we just have to lobby hard um, to get those messages out there. Thank you. It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, why don't those who make decisions or in the authority position to make decisions. Uh, listen to people like you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. I can't answer that one. Look, I, I think um, organisations like Pure Advantage, and, and that's the group I'm working with, and, and for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a group of um, business people, um, uh, Philip Mills, um, Stephen Tyndall, so Stephen Tyndall, um, Rob Morrison, um, Dayman Salmond and others who, she's not a business person, but that pure advantage are, are incredibly um, important, I think, and, and I think it's those sorts of people that can, you know, potentially take this message through and have those connections. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've argued for this stuff and others are arguing for it and lots of people are arguing for it and I, I think we just need more and more people to argue for it. And look, change will come. I just hope it doesn't come too late. Um, and we just got to push as hard as we can. So that's why I was really happy to talk tonight, and, and um, I'm certainly um, writing stuff and putting stuff out there, and I'll continue to do that to try and raise these issues, and I know others are as well. Is there very much been done in this direction by Pamu farmers? That's a really interesting question. I was pretty shocked um, driving through um, Southland recently to see a whole lot of carbon um, forestry going in on, palm, on a Pamu farm. I mean, 
A farmer once said to me that, you know, we could get rid of all of New Zealand's um, methane emissions obligations by just closing Pamu down, which I thought was interesting. Um, no, I don't know, and it's a really good question. And, and I mean, um, we did have um, the chair of Pamu talk at the conference last year. I wasn't very impressed, to be quite honest. Um, I think um, that, that's an area where there could be a lot of pressure put, for sure. It's a good, good suggestion. Thank you. There's someone down the front here. I saw a hand go up. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, my name's Pete McKenzie, I'm a farm supervisor. And I was out on Hilly Hilly Toe Station with 3,000 odd hectares of land in Wairau uh, with my grandson the other day. Um, but just looking around the, the farm, um, we have about 800 hectares in native bush, um, which we put into La Whenua Rahui and other things. Um, we've got catchment plantings through the gullies. Um, but the cost of maintaining that 800 hectares falls flatly on, on the station itself. Mm. Uh, rates, weed control, um, controlling wild goats, um, beer. So who's going to fund that uh, yeah. for the freehold landowner? Yeah. That, that's a really good question, thank you. And and so what what we're envisaging is not a you know a one-off funding thing. We need ongoing funding, and that's my comment at the end about catchment groups and and finding something to replace um, the jobs for nature. And we we've suggested call, let's call it jobs for for Papatu Anuku. Um, but that's where we should have ongoing funding for this. I mean, the funding isn't a one-off thing, and these these areas need management for decades and decades. So I, I think it should be coming out of the sorts of pools of funding I've been talking about. Um, for, for that sort of work. It sounds like you've got some awesome stuff on your property too. I'm really pleased to hear that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we've been waiting a long time for the central government to make changes. Um, can you give us any hot tips in what local government can do to help this change happen? I, th I think the challenge there is, as, and I realise we have the Mayor here, lo 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 local government is struggling to deal with, with, with the problems that climate change is imposing on our, our built infrastructure, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, look, I don't have any simple solutions because um, it's, it's a massive burden, that in itself. Um, I do believe the question from the previous um, person asked about rates relief is, is certainly one thing. It's only a minor thing, um, but it certainly is something that could help. Um, but I'm equally conscious that um, you know, rates fund all this infrastructure too that we also need. Um, I think, you know, in many ways, local government, to me, can be the moral, um, provide the moral support and, and the lobbying of central government, because that, that's, to me, is a really important role of local government. So, yeah. Jim, I would love to ask your opinion and ask if you, um, I assume you submitted to the EPS Computation Forestry, because what you are saying is a lot of common sense. Um, I am a mayor, and we have submitted several times in 2015 to the EPS Plantation Forestry. Yeah. Um, not successful always in mm. being submitted because we are well aware that some of or lots of the regulation incentivised behaviours that in the end have unintended consequences. So um, uh, just like my colleague Colin just asked you as a local, uh, because in your, spe in your speech you not once mentioned local government and mm. I know there is a real desire amongst us as well. I know we often work with rules that are not fit for purpose, but we are the ones facing the community and it is often very tough that we have to enforce or use rules that are not fit for purpose. So um, I would love to hear your opinion on the NPS plantation forestry and also your opinion on the independent inquiry that recently, or, or, or the results that will come out um, very soon. And uh, yeah, I'm just interested on your yeah. thoughts on the NPS. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. And, and look, I appreciate you coming tonight. That, that's awesome. Um, gosh, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. Um, so in terms of the inquiry, um, my, my submission was, was basically what I said today, I think we should be um, stopping all clear felling, which I think is a very hard decision, but we should be, central government should be putting a process in place to assess catchment by catchment where harvesting is and isn't suitable. 
And to me, that, that, that should be happening right now. And it, uh, I've been pretty shocked that there were five boats parked up in the harbour yesterday, you know, and one in the port already. I mean, you know, clearly we're still harvesting, and if another cyclone comes down next week, what's going to happen? Um, I find that, that quite perplexing that it's happening. So I guess with the, with the um, inquiry, I, I would like to see that decision made. It's going to be hard for the forestry companies, but I think, you know, if there's a, a, a I mean, uh, there'll be a lot of plantations that are quite suitable to keep harvesting, but let's do the assessment first. Um, that really scares me. In terms of the NPS, look, look, it's it's the same as a freshwater NP, NPS, isn't it? Um, you make a set of rules in Wellington, and then you try and roll them out around the country. They don't work. I mean, the NPS for freshwater talked about post and batten fences. We don't use post and batten fences in the South Island. <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. Um, but then, how far do you go? You know, it's. Like I think I like the idea of having a nationally consistent set of rules, but I also like the idea of allowing a degree of local flexibility. And I think we've we, we've probably gone too far with a national consistent set of rules and and not allowed enough local flexibility. But it does worry me in some parts of the country um, that too much local flexibility could also be bad. And 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 I'm thinking about Taipatini, the west coast of the South Island. You know. Um, you know, so it's it's tricky um, getting the balance right, but I do believe that we've got to be very cautious, and I think freshwater and plantation forestry are exactly the same, and I'm very involved with the biodiversity NPS as well, and again, exactly the same issues apply there. And I think to me, you know, um, I've always argued this for many, many years now in what I've been writing and, and talking about um, biodiversity. It's great to say something is significant or important or whatever, it's how you manage it that actually counts, and too often we think, or, or um, the bureaucrats in Wellington think, as long as we've got the rules in place, everything will be fine. It won't be fine. We actually have to have the on-the-ground management for whatever the issue is. I sort of half answered your question, so. Uh, hi, David. Uh, Charles Rowe. I wrote a report for this a couple of years ago uh, on completely agree with um, what you said, so I think the key, you know, is how do we fund Mm. How do we fund? Because unless you find an ability to fund what you're talking about, it, it largely won't happen. And yep. I was looking at the funding sources you put up there, and just a question around the priority of those. Um, I suppose my own thoughts were if our ETS works because we require emitters to buy credits, and emitters go to exotic monocultures because that's the cheapest source of credit. If we simply require emitters to buy biodiverse credits, mm. um, would that not fund the transition you're mm. talking about? Yeah. That's, that's a really good question, and look, I'm an ecologist, I'm not an economist, and, and Pure Advantage have got people working on that financial question, and it's, it's not something that I've got you know, obviously much expertise in. But I think your idea is a good one, and that, that's why I'm arguing and others are arguing we need, we need to take exotic forest out of the ETS, or at least out of the... Well, in fact, put it into a separate... I think uh, Rod Carr, the Climate Change Commissioner, suggested putting it into a separate um, system altogether. And I think that would allow, would provide quite a bit of that funding to address native afforestation for sure. You're making Renee run around a lot here. <laughs> I, I have to say, Renee, I, I watched you on that thing recently. You were awesome. You were incredible. Give you a big clap. Well, I, yeah. yeah, interesting question. I, I think, you know, catchment groups, again, I come back to catchment groups, you know, working with catchment groups, communities working with catchment groups, that, that gives all of that. And I, I really believe strongly, I mean, the, 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 the social science people talk about um, nature deficit disorder and things like that, it's real. You know, and I think connecting our, our young people to nature is so important. But I really believe catchment groups, I'm not sure about a right to roam law, it's, it's a, there's a whole raft of other issues in that. But I think that working with catchment groups, you know, urban communities working with catchment groups, getting out there, kids getting out there being involved. Sure, 
Ora, thank you for your presentation. I'm not sure whether you'll be able to help, but I've asked this question um, if we've been here previously, and that is uh, within the DOC system, uh, part of the PCLs when it comes to treaty settlements, any PCLs within a iwi um, settlement process uh, typically has gone back to the Department of Conservation and the Lokuma Pananga is a classic example and that sits within uh, the iwi of Ngāti Pau. Um, so when we look at um, indigenous um, forests and ngāhere, how do we incentivise the opportunity for um, iwi to receive recognition for a PCR that is funded by a DOC but actually sits within a treaty space? Um, that's a really hard question for me to answer, I'm sorry. Um, my, my comment again would be though that I'm aware there's a lot of um, jobs for nature funding supporting iwi up in this part of, of, of the country and I think if we've got to find ways to keep that funding going because that, that's the way to, to do that I think. But I, I, beyond that I couldn't comment, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I work with Bone and um, yeah. at tertiary level, and we quite often bring up the subject of um, biodiversity now. Um, in college, even though we have screen production uh, primarily, it's a, it's a hot topic in the region, obviously. Um, and the point we keep referring back to is that uh, the majority of policy has been driven by forward science. Um, the, the science, or well, imported science that allowed us to clear about our land, the science that determined that um, post bowl and the best way to protect the land was plantation forestry. Yeah. Uh, you'd be just as aware as I am, there's a footnote uh, that there's a risk of, um, that, that in the uh, review of the plantation forestry, uh, that there's a risk of damage reoccurring mm. uh, during felling in a, a significant event. Mm. And yet, uh, the worry was that they would have to raise bridges every 35 years mm. uh, for because of increasing silt levels. Mm. Yeah, we have to replace those bridges now because of logs going out. Mm. When do we trust the science? Yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really good question. Actually, I left out a slide I was going to include um, talking about legacies of the past. And I mean, you know, we have the legacies of the early clear felling, which government actually you had to clear to be able to get your land sort of thing. And then we had the legacies here of, of, of Cyclone Bowler. Um, and and we're, getting, we're going to have the legacies from carbon farming. But you can see the same thing in, you know, we, we brought, you know, mustelids into New Zealand to control rabbits because we thought it was the right thing to do. You know, we, we've, done, we've done that multiple times. I don't know. And, and, and I, guess, I guess to me, and this, this is a really philosophical discussion and I don't want to go into it too far, you know, Western science, of course, is, 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 as I'm sure everyone's well aware, is, is so grounded in this idea of, you know, man has dominion over nature and all that sort of stuff. And, 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 it's, 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 and it runs right through to the present day. We see it in, in a lot of dock policies and on public conservation land, you know. Um, Got to keep people away because it's the best way to look after nature. So I think, I mean, it's not really answering your question, but to me, to me the, the best way that we can address those issues is not about the science per se, but it's getting people connected with the issues. And I think with biodiversity and carbon, I think um, if people... Everybody is connected with those issues. I think the science will also be tied in with that, and I think that's going to give us a much better outcome. And I guess traditional knowledge, you know, Mataranga Māori becomes a really important part of that too, because that is the knowledge about this biodiversity in Aotearoa. So I guess to me it's about getting away from that traditional Western approach to science that says, or to conservation, to biodiversity, that says nature's here and people are over here. We've got to bring people into nature, and I think the science will come with that. And I, I, I think, and bringing in indigenous knowledge as well is critical. That, that's you know, uh, it's a long philosophical discussion, but I think that's the answer in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, 
on the, uh, the last comment about mm. when can we uh, trust the science. One thing that's, which has always intrigued me is um, under the ETS lookup tables, I know the, the lack of science around mm. carbon sequestration in, mm. in that forest, but also in soil. Mm. And I read many years ago from James Lovelock saying that the biggest um, cycle on the planet for carbon is the ocean. Mm. The second biggest is, is soil. Mm. And if we just lift it, organic um, levels of soils, be they agricultural, horticultural, or in forestry, mm. you could probably take the most of the, the surplus carbon out of the atmosphere. Mm. So, are you, what work mm. are you aware of which is going on to really try to understand what is happening with the soil? The soil sequestration of carbon, mm. so that that can be built because you talk about biodiversity credits. Mm. And to me, I think we're missing a huge um, component. And when you start looking at the economics of use of native forestry and reforestation. Yeah, that, that's a really good question too, thank you. And look, I'm not a soil scientist, but I do have some thoughts and, and a bit of experience with it. I mean, clearly the whole regenerative farming uh, movement has, has shown, and there is good science that has shown that by not cultivating your soils and, and not doing all those things to it, you will increase the carbon in your soils. The challenge with the farming, I'll come on to forestry in a minute, the challenge with the farming is that New Zealand soils are globally quite high in carbon anyway. So our gains are probably much less than, say, in a, in a more arid system like in Australia. So, but I think, you know, th there's a lot of common sense in not putting a plough through a field, for example, in terms of soil carbon and, and a lot of other reasons as well. In the forest case, it, it's a complicated argument. We know, and there's been a lot of research done, I couldn't give you the references off the top of my head, but I think I've seen figures like 80% of the carbon in an in a intact old growth forest is in the soil and 20% is in the biomass. The problem with those arguments, when we start looking at New Zealand um, and we look at um, arguing about carbon forestry, probably carbon, you know, plant and leave plantations for carbon Onto, onto pasture will probably have similar ratios between above ground and below ground as, as a native forestation, reforestation on pasture. Um, so I think we need to be cautious about using those arguments to say natives better than, 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 planta than, than exotics. But clearly with, um, with our harvesting systems, our clear fell harvesting systems, that's a very different situation because as we know we lose a lot of the soil. Um, even, even in flat areas like you know, Kaingaroa there still is a lot of disturbance to the soil. So we are losing a fair chunk of the carbon there compared to a native forest. But then we also need to be really cautious in Aotearoa because our major natural forest disturbance events are landslides and tree wind throws and things like that that actually turn the soil over as well. So, and we know even along the east coast of, of the North Island, we know that there is a long history going back tens of thousands of years of sediment deposition out at sea. Um, people have done work on it and shown it. So, it, it, yes, you're right, but it's a, we've got to be cautious about it as well. And the science, from what I understand, is still really lagging. Um, You've talked about the ETS and the changes. How much do you think that can actually be unwound? Because it seems to be the consequence, you know, they commonly say, you know, carbon needs to reach 200 dollars before it really changes mm. its behaviours. Mm. And you can see when it hits 65, it actually blows a lot of other land uses out of the water. That yeah. It's going in the trees. I mean, can it be unwound to a certain extent? Yeah, for years ago, the other option was a carbon tax. Mm, mm. Some like you bring for your petrol and medicine, methane mm. and medicine, do this sort of thing, whereas this is actually leading to market yeah. economics to do it. How much yeah. are we too far down that track yeah. to actually do anything? Yeah, a good question. I'm not a politician, um, but um, I've got some thoughts. <laughs> thoughts on most of these issues. Um, I think, um, just to deal with the carbon tax thing first, I think with all of these issues, and again, I should have said and I didn't say it in my presentation, we've also got to be thinking about social inequality. You know, whatever we do has to address social inequality. And I, I see a lot of this recloaking Papatua Anuku is about addressing social inequality, about you know, having a job for Papatua Anuku, having schools involved as a way to try and address that. And certainly with a carbon tax, you know, if petrol is suddenly going to be you know, $5 a litre more, I mean, clearly that's got to be addressed with other tools sitting out there. I, I think there are some strong, very strong political signals 
being made or noises being made about fundamentally resetting the ETS. I mean, Rod Carr doesn't mince his words, and, and you know, I've got a lot of... I, th I think Rod Carr is, is a really important person in this, and I mean, he is saying their advice to government is you have to take plantations out of the ETS. So, you know, I mean, whether government will listen and whether government will listen in an election year, I don't know, and whether the power of the lobbyists is greater than the power of Rod Carr, I don't know. It's not the space I work in. But I take a lot of... I guess I'm a bottle half full rather than half empty person, and when I hear people like Rod Carr saying that, I do feel you know more confident. Um, but no, it's going to need a lot of lobbying to get the change. Because my God, if it was two hundred dollars a ton, um, we might as well say goodbye to farming in Aotearoa. Yeah. yeah. No, if you're a, um, we each have the power of vote this year. So my question to you would be, what would you be listening for in the policy statements during the campaign that would lead you to think that a particular political party or group of parties were approaching these issues <coughs> in a way that would invite you to vote for them? I'll answer that question really simply by saying I've got a four-month-old grandchild now. So I'm looking for policies that are going to guarantee her future. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I'm looking for policies that are going to work. Policies that um, that are, are thinking about more than just the next three years. Um, and and I guess I'll be looking for a party that's going to um, be serious about tackling climate change. So that's what I'll be looking for. Right. I didn't even have a drink of water. <laughs> Should be a politician. Um, yeah, thank you again, David. Um, really do appreciate you taking the time out and sharing your mātauranga with us. Um, and to you fellows for great questions, you know, and I think it shows the calibre of thinking and action that's going on uh, in our district, the kind of questions and the examples that are given of what is happening. So I think we, while we're all sort of struggling and, and challenged by these big issues uh, and feeling very vulnerable as a region at the moment. Um, we also, the turnout tonight and the, the quality of the corridor demonstrates our commitment uh, to uh, doing what we can with urgency to address these challenges. Um, we've got a little group, it's pretty much me and Renee. Um, <laughs> called Tuiu uh, Tairawhiti or Tuiu Charitable Trust. We set this trust up at the end of last year because we kind of felt like there wasn't a group in the community that was really driving this conversation around land use and climate change. Um, it, now it feels a little prophetic given what's happened in the last few months but um, it's really important and we're sort of just doing what we can to continue the conversation uh, and uh, sort of we didn't get a sign-in sheet or anything but um, you can info at tweweu.nz -E um, We'll connect you with us and we'll put on some more events. We're going to have an event after the inquiry report is released. Um, so it's due to the Minister on the 12th of May and um, we're not sure when the Ministers will release that after they've got it. But hoping that it's not that it's sit on it for too long and we'll have a bit of a panel discussion with a few commentators locally to have some initial reactions and some ideas about uh, where we could go with their recommendations, whether we feel like the, the practical and uh, doable are going to make a difference or um, need more uh, stringent and um, or, yeah, strident uh, action uh, going forward. So uh, look out for that and we'll try and yeah, get some publicity. So in the next two or three weeks we should have another event back here um, around that. Um, and probably a bunch of other stuff. Um, Rangai is going to be doing more on this conversation using uh, online uh, media and things to keep the conversation going. So Rangai Studios got a YouTube and, uh, and every other media um, platform uh, to yeah sign up there and keep a lookout. Um, and what else, Renee? A few other things that we we'll do for now. When yeah. Um, oh, well, yeah, so I think that, that question, the nut we've got to crack as a region is how we're going to pay for this stuff, the number of people have raised, and 
I'm heartened to see that you know there are a number of businesses, and I was talking to a researcher yesterday who surveyed businesses in New Zealand, and the vast majority of them said that they would pay a premium on their carbon that they are buying if it was available. Uh, the ETS doesn't really allow for it at the moment, but that's an option uh, that could help fund some of this stuff. Um, the recloaking re Papa Tōnuku is a great initiative that hopefully also um, generates support uh, and puts the pressure onto those companies, as David was saying, that uh, benefit off the um, not only the ETS but the brand of clean and green um, that we might want to see them contributing further to. Uh, because we can't, as David said, rely just on government grants to fund jobs for nature. We've got to find ways of making it sustainable revenue. And Toha locally is also trying to do that, create a marketplace for biodiversity, regenerative agriculture projects that uh, companies and philanthropy and government can all co-invest in. Um, so those sort of opportunities are going to be important as well. But having a plan as a region is going to be really important there transition plan from, if we're going to say actually we can't harvest and we can't farm on this steep erosion prone land, there's going to be a lot of displaced workers and far no affected in that process, so we need a plan for those jobs in pest control and managing the native uh, forests and developing new industries around um, more diverse uh, sectors to um, replace the jobs that will be lost in forestry and farming. So that's the, the big job that we all need to be working on and hopefully council takes some responsibility, but we can all, you know, and as David was saying, probably shouldn't leave it up to the officials and things to do that. We've got to um, do that ourselves. So um, those catchment management plans will be really important feeding into that. Um, we, so we need those catchment groups healthy and, and operating around the region. There's some great examples already and more that need to be stood up. Um, but getting that just transition plan underway is really important. And we did try 10 years ago, didn't we, Ron? And, um, Bob, you know, sort of transition tied up for tea. We saw peak oil coming, but we need to sort of, you know, get that going again and get that plan with all of us putting into it to work out where we're going to fund these jobs from uh, and get a more sustainable uh, land use across the, the region that we have at the moment. So look forward to you all contributing to that as well. And again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, David. And we look forward to your ongoing contributions to our region. Thank you.